Honourable Senator, I rise to add my voice to Senator Coyle's inquiry on Canada's transition to a net zero emissions future. Thank you to our colleague for initiating this urgent conversation. The transition must include, to quote Senator Coyle, finding innovative and effective ways to ensure the people, communities and regions most closely impacted by the transition to a net zero economy are considered, have a voice and are supported. Coming from Saskatchewan and Treaty 4 territory, I agree. Our Federation must prioritize the inclusion of Western Canada, Indigenous nations, and all regions in net zero solutions and economic opportunities. A fair transition must be a whole of nation priority and effort. No one left behind, tailored to the unique advantages and challenges of every region, all towards economic benefits across the country. By working together, our Federation can achieve a successful green transition, supporting the prosperity of Canadian workers and their families the well-being of our grandchildren and future generations, and Canada being all it can be. Today I'll add to this climate inquiry my view on three topics. First, Canada's path to net zero emissions. Second, Saskatchewan's unique contributions and challenges. And third, Indigenous environmental leadership and stewardship. Senators, I begin with Canada's path to net zero. On climate action, we must succeed. Science requires limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. This is the goal of the 2015 Paris Agreement. To put the 1.5 target in perspective, 2023, likely the worst, warmest uh, year in the last 120,000 years based on scientific evidence. This past summer, Canada experienced terrible wildfire wildfires, floods, and drought, all worsened by climate change. As of September, 44 million acres of forest burned across Canada, negating the carbon stored in the trees and the soil. That's 8.5 times the normal rate. Fire forced the evacuation of Yellowknife, flash floods hit Nova Scotia, drought struck the prairies. Climate disasters also struck globally, including extreme heat and fires in Europe, forcing evacuations in Greece, the deadliest U.S. wildfire in over a century in Hawaii with drier conditions due to climate change, and floods in Libya with nearly 4,000 people killed and over 9,000 missing. Such events will worsen even if we meet our goal. To save a livable Earth, humanity must achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Canadians must do our part by meeting this goal domestically and by supporting international efforts to fulfill the Paris Agreement. We are making progress. Canada's 2022 overall emissions were 6.3% below 2005 levels, despite a population increase of 24% in the same period. Reductions are therefore evident and achievable. However, our country's target for 2030 is to reduce emissions 40 to 45% below 25 levels. On that, we have a long way to go, and we're, we've seen some setbacks. Canada's 2022 emissions increased 2.1% compared to the previous year, mostly due to a cold winter, increased oil and gas production emissions, and increased building heating requirements. Looking ahead, Parliament has passed laws designed to deliver results over time. Two planks of the country's federal climate plan are the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, adopted by Parliament in 2018, and the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, adopted in 2021. Of course, all targets and policies must consider factors unique to each region. With the first plank, carbon pricing incentivizes economic decisions to reduce emissions against an escalating cost of such pollution. It's basic economics. When the price goes up, demand goes down. We therefore can expect improved results over time if existing laws remain in place. The 2021 statute brings transparency and accountability to the plan to meet our targets. This is a sensible approach to a problem we must solve, concurrently providing certainty for provinces or pardon me, businesses and consumers investing to reduce emissions. Notably, notably federal carbon pricing was pre preceded by our country's first output-based carbon pricing in Alberta in 2007 for large emitters, followed by Quebec introducing the first carbon tax later that year. I encourage Parliament's focus on climate action. In 2021, I voted for the net zero accountability legislation, 
along with three quarters of this Senate. Of course, the details of carbon pricing must remain sub subject to periodic valuation and potential adjustments. To together, our Federation must deliver fair outcomes, sector-specific strategies, and overall results. I note that the federal government plans to engage provinces, territories, and indigenous organizations in an interim review of federal carbon pricing by 2026. The review, review will ensure alignment of pricing stringency across Canada, as well as evaluating impacts on interjurisdictional and international competitiveness. This is a responsible re re approach if out outcomes are based on meaningful consultation with all partners. We need to set goals and policies from the outside in if we want everyone throwing their collective shoulder behind the wheel and pushing in the same direction. I trust all members of the Federation will engage to represent the voices of their people, nations and regions. Let's not forget this country was built largely on compromise and cooperation. The next lift needs to include meaningful advanced consultation. Senators, I turn to Saskatchewan's unique contributions and challenges around climate action. Our areas of strength include the world's first clean coal power station at the Boundary Dam, preventing 5 million tonnes of CO2 from entering the atmosphere since operations began, equivalent to removing over 1 million vehicles from the, yard, from the road for a year. Carbon capture utilization and storage technologies, including the petroleum techno technology researches Center's award-winning Aquastore, demonstrating effective carbon storage in the world's first CO2, CO2 storage site, a deep saline aquifer. Flood and drought mitigation and water management through the proposed expansion of Lake Dief Diefenbaker irrigation, supporting sustainable agriculture, food processing, and food security. Protein Industries Canada is our plant protein supercluster, which is a great segue to another strength and that's refinement of bio biofuels, including diesel and aviation fuel, at new refinery assets underway. Solios, a new sustainable, non-polluting and climate-positive micronutrient fertilizer that assists farmers in boosting their yield while returning carbon to the soil <coughs> and enhancing nutrient cycling. Critical minerals, including uranium from the world's largest high-grade deposits to fuel regional and other reactors and small modular reactors with Estevan and Elbow identified as potential sites in our province. With its many climate change strengths, Saskatchewan also faces unique challenges in achieving a green economy. Earlier this month, during Senate question period, I asked about the federal proposal to achieve a net zero energy grid in Canada by 2035, with Minister Gilbo having announced draft regulations in August. I raised the point that Saskatchewan has no access to large-scale hydropower, to support intermittent renewables like wind and solar. In contrast, 80% of Canada's population is already served by clean hydropower. Ergo, not one size fits all, and it will be extremely difficult and, cost, and costly for Saskatchewan to meet the deadlines of 2030 and 2035 on a comparative basis. While well, Saskatchewan can meet the 2050 net zero goal, some compromise and collab collaboration would be required and useful on the road ahead toward 2050. I was pleased to hear Senator Gold indicate that the federal government is committed to working with its partners to address unique challenges. I interpret that to include Saskatchewan, a partner in this great federation where we strive to have none left behind. Collaboration must be the approach of any federal provincial government of the day based on shared commitment to effective climate action. We shall also expect collaboration with Indigenous nations. This leads to my final topic, how Canada can benefit from Indigenous environmental leadership, including Indigenous values, jurisdiction, and resource, resources essential to clean technology. On the land and, wa and waters that we now call Canada, Indigenous peoples have practiced sustainability and respect for nature since time immemorial. Indigenous environmental leadership begins with traditional wisdom. The report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission stated, and I quote, reconciliation between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians from an Aboriginal perspective also requires reconciliation with the natural world. If human beings resolve problems between themselves but continue to destroy the natural world, then reconciliation remains incomplete. Reciprocity and mutual respect help us sustain our survival, end quote. 
In 2021, Parliament upheld Indigenous inherent rights, inherent rights and jurisdiction by adopting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into federal law. This shift unlocked huge opportunities for Indigenous leadership to contribute to effective climate action. As I noted, noted in our debate on the Net Zero Accountability Bill, reconciliation and environmental stewardship are connected. In 2020, Manga Bay, an environmental science publication, reported that globally, Indigenous people currently manage or have tenure on 40% of the world's protected areas and remaining intact ecosystems. With meaningful jurisdiction, Indigenous leadership can make a critical difference around the world in preserving biodiversity, biodiversity and vital ecosystems and mitigating the effects of climate change. Here are a few examples of Indigenous-led conservation effort, efforts that contribute to Canada's nature-based climate solutions by sequestering carbon in soil and plant life. In 2019, the Dene Nene came into existence as a 14,000 square kilometer national reserve park in the Northwest Territories, co-managed by the Lutsal K Dene First Nation and the Canadian government. Other examples include 64,000 square kilometers Great Bear Rainforest in BC, the 29,000 square kilometer Pemimach Chewin Aki in Manitoba and Ontario, being the largest protected area in North America, Boreal Shield, and the 108,000 kilometer Tulu Ruti Up Imanga National Marine, Marine Cons Conservation Area in Nunavut. Senators, many Indigenous nations are shifting to clean energy. For example, this year in Saskatchewan, the Metal Lake Tribal Council opened Canada's first Indigenous-owned bioenergy facility to heat 5,000 homes using wood waste from a nearby sawmill. In 2021, also in my province, province Kaos's First Nation unveiled a new solar project aiming to become Canada's greenest First Nation with 800 panels installed on five community buildings. In northern BC, coastal nation, Kitasu Hai Hai owns and operates their own small storage hydroelectric plant, delivering clean energy to the community year-round, along with a solar installation on their school roof. Other nations in the region are also exploring similar projects to replace diesel generation. According to the Indigenous-governed, Indigenous not-for-profit organization, Indigenous Clean Energy, nearly 200 medium to large renewable energy projects with Indigenous involvement are now in operation or in the final stages of planning or construction across Canada. In addition, 1,700 to 2,100 micro or small renewable systems are now in place with Indigenous leadership or partnerships. Further opportunities exist for Indigenous-led climate action through responsible development of critical minerals required for clean technology, along with addi additional solar and wind sites. Last year, Royal Bank of Canada reported that Canadian Indigenous territories Tories, hold at least 50%, 56% of advanced critical min minerals projects, 35% of top solar sites, and 44% of better wind sites. As I said in May, as a sponsor of government bill advancing economic reconciliation, business leaders and investors should run, not walk, to consult Indigenous nations on these opportunities. Senators, to conclude, climate action is the only path to a bright future for our grandchildren and future generations. Time is running out. Our generation must not fail young people and those yet to come, nor, nor can we fail our fellow, fellow creatures. Our Chamber's influence can help foster collaboration and federation on Mission Net Zero. To this end, I thank Senator Cole for helping to keep climate action top of mind particularly at a time of war, unthinkable tourism or terrorism, inflation, and many other geopolitical challenges. Make no mistake, progress is achievable. Canadians must press on together with our brothers and sisters around the world to save our only home, Mother Earth. Thank you. Merci. Thank you.